Hello, and welcome to the Sudo Show, where business meets open source. My name is Bill, and I am joined by the Warriors of Wayland, Neil and Brandon. How is summer treating you both? Ah, well, it's been a f- actually kind of packed summer for me so far, and I don't think it's stopping anytime soon. But otherwise, it's been fun. How about you, Brandon? It's been a low key one for me myself. Uh, yeah, you know, between the last time we recorded, I got to see Neil twice, which is <laughs> two times more than I actually expected. So that was uh, that was good to be able to catch up with him in person. Uh, now I need to get out to Connecticut and just meet with both of you out there. I have also seen Neil twice in person, uh, most recently for 4th of July barbecue and shenanigans, in which case Neil ate food and I got soaked in the rain while trying to cook. I was very impressed at how well you cooked while the rain was just pouring down on you. I got to go swimming without actually going in the lake. That is what I took away from that day. But regardless, uh, Neil and I had a wonderful time playing around with open source hardware, software, and everything in between. And speaking of open source hardware, today we're going to talk about something kind of interesting, which is the IPO of Raspberry Pi as a company. And this kind of stands out in many ways from other open source projects because Raspberry Pi kind of started off as a hobbyist project and it's turned into so much more than that. We see Raspberry Pi devices not just in education, but across all sorts of verticals. So maybe Brandon and Neil, you guys have some insight into what made this possible and how did it all begin for them? It was a lot like how Linux emerged as uh, a hobbyist project in the 90s and turned into, rather quickly, a production-grade system that took over the the entire internet. I mean, ran, meaning taking over the internet, running the internet. I mean, not at, when the internet first started, it was uh, AIX, Solaris, that was, was running web servers on the public internet, at mostly Solaris. And then, turn, and then it quickly turned into Linux because it was cheaper. It were, ran on commodity hardware. And Raspberry Pi is the epitome of commodity hardware, considering its price point. Yeah, you know, some anywhere between. Uh, I think the cheapest one is fifty dollars, and all the way up to a hundred. I mean, that is the definition of commodity: being able to get it out into into that into such a mass market at such a low price point. And because it started off as this hobbyist project people are starting to create products for uh that's that were driven from their hobbies like whether this is uh uh, taking sensors say ph sensors and attaching them to the board and take ph readings from your home aquarium things like that right that's the that's what has set this apart. It made this type of hardware that was industrial, like out uh, typically out of reach of everyone else, of the everyday consumer, and basically changed the way we all w- w- uh, enthusiasts like us think about how how to develop a develop a new hobby or even develop a new product uh that it's a uh, it's definitely made it much easier to develop new things so in a way it kind of became one of the cornerstone devices of the whole IoT movement IoT came first raspberry pi just made it less crappy oh yeah and i have words about this so one of the big things about the raspberry pi Actually, two things. One, it was a right place, right time kind of thing. We were at the we were on the precipice of computing being used 
in a much more distributed case where it became necessary to have smaller devices and have them tailored. So if you look at just a few years before the Raspberry Pi product first came out, um, there were discussions in industry about, well, how do we build smaller PC type devices? They wanted to scale up, but they wanted to keep the cost low and they needed a way to be able to do this kind of stuff. And the problem was there was no way to get the volume fast enough to get the price down quick enough to make any business succeed. So that's the first bit. Second bit is the Raspberry Pi was founded specifically to give kids the ability to tinker with the computer in the way that those people did when they were growing up. So I grew up in the early 90s. And so at that time, tinkerable computers were going away, but I still had access to them either secondhand or through tag sales or whatever, but, or I could, you know, have them, uh, I could still buy computer parts and assemble them. Now you fast forward 30 years and that's actually much harder now. While it's true, you can still build a computer, you can still assemble it. The predominant way people get computers are hermetically sealed, fully assembled, soldered devices. And that takes away a lot of the magic around, or, or rather that makes the computers themselves magic, right? In some, in some sense. And, you know, I think it was like 15 years ago that they started. They saw that this was happening and they wanted to give people the same experience that they had. They're British. So their comparison was talking about the BBC Micro, uh, which I think was an Altair Sinclair or something like that, or I forget what, what it was here in the U.S., but um, or maybe it never came here. I don't know. Anyway, BBC Micro, that was that was part of their introduction. The idea was give people a way to have that kind of Lego block experience and bit banging and all this other stuff. You work close to the metal in a way that is affordable and accessible. The Raspberry Pi Foundation, because it was a nonprofit, it was a charity and it was working for the public benefit, in this particular case, educating children on computing technology, they were able to take advantage of opportunities that aren't available in the commercial space. For example, they made a good deal. They were able to make good deals with Broadcom and other companies to essentially source the parts needed to produce this device at near nothing or basically nothing. Moreover, they were able to get donated support and engineering and all that effort to produce it, that allowed them to launch a $25 single board computer. Practically created the market segment, but more importantly, it allowed them to primarily focus on how to provide materials to teach people how to use it. Now, I'm talking about all this education and talking about kids, and that might not be relevant. That You may think that that's not relevant for the industry or, or commercialization. But I disagree kids, with that. Yeah, yeah, I disagree yeah, yeah. with that. But those kids are now college grade or they're in industry now or they're working in as interns. And guess what they're bringing with them? A new degree of computer literacy, a reinvigorated interest in building technology the way that we did 20 or 30 years ago and an increased aptitude and appetite for digging deep into and for problem solving, right? These these things were things that legitimately a lot of people were afraid were going to go away. And because of how low cost it was, how accessible it was, and how broad it went, they solved the industry problem of getting things up to scale, but they also solved the education and the appetite problem of do we want people do do people want to work on these kinds of things? Because it was also legitimately starting to become a problem. People were have the companies were starting to struggle to find people who wanted to do this stuff because computers were getting too magical. They were getting too hard. They were also getting too complicated to figure out to be able to do this stuff. And that kind of shortage could be very dangerous. So by focusing on something that is explicitly not industrial, they were able to have they created second order and third order effects to actually benefit the commercial and industry space. This is actually one of the reasons why I harp on so much that it is absolutely short-sighted 
to primarily focus on your first order target market. You should always think about your second and third order and work backwards. So like, for example, if you're building something that is an enterprise solution that allows people to do, I don't know, mass deployments at scale with a with an interesting new methodology and tooling, well, you'd say, okay, well, my first order way of thinking is let's go talk to the com- companies and get them bought on board and all this other stuff. Now, the long game is to go work your way backwards. You start from talking to kids and getting getting interested scholars and, and hobbyists interested, and then they come into the workforce invigorated and interested and excited about these things, and then they they bring those technologies forward and they make them stay there forever. Staying power. This is how Linux succeeded 30 years ago. It's how Google has succeeded in the education space now. And mm-hmm. I, I know this because, as scary as this sounds, some of the students that I worked with when I first started in education are now business leaders. And when they contact me for consulting services, the number one request that they have is, how do we move out of Microsoft and into Google Workspace? It is the first question that they ask me because that's the tooling that they grew up with and that they got to put their hands on. Now, having worked in a store called Radio Shack many moons ago, I grew up with amateur radio, resistors, capacitors, PCBs, and I really wish that the Raspberry Pi had kind of existed during that time because it would have reinvigorated a part store like that. I'll take this a step further where you discuss building computers. One of the things that we're starting to do now is work with SB32 boards via the SB Home Project, building our own IoT sensors and controls and, and automations. That's been fun to not just get back into how is a computer built, but how is a computer built at its core fundamental principles? How do you provide power to it? How do you address memory? How do you write code to the firmware of the device? It's a little modernized now that you have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but those are just communication mechanisms like we had for Ethernet or even serial port decades ago. But the most important thing, Neil, that you mentioned was kind of this collaboration from education, from industry, and everybody else to kind of wrap this up and make it happen. And that, to me, is one of the benefits of open source, not just as a business model, but as a, as a lifestyle, as a, as a community. And so one of the questions that I kind of have is what parts of open source incorporate into the governance of Raspberry Pi? Are they bringing any of that ideology with them to the party? Are, are you guys aware of anything that discusses open source initiatives specifically, or do you kind of just organically see it as a way that they manage their organization? I think it's neither of those. So if you look at how the Raspberry Pi Foundation does things, they don't look at it from a sense of open source versus proprietary or whatever. The Raspberry Pi Foundation has stated in their charter, their goal is to educate kids on computer technology and to improve computer literacy. Everything they do is around that. And here's the thing. Open source is a means to an end for that because everything around open source software is stuff you can look at, you can modify, you can build, you can distribute, share, and they can modify and share again. So it's not that they specifically went out towards open source because if you look at how they do the hardware stuff, you still have this Broadcom core thing that for many years is not open source and there's still parts of the Broadcom core that isn't. The board designs are partly closed. They're not, they're, most of it's open these days, but it, used, it wasn't that way in the beginning. They've, always, they've moved towards making it more open, but it's because their goal is to teach people how computers are put together and work. If you don't have that as a goal, you're not doing any of this. So the side effect is that this has invigorated this idea of open hardware. This has invigorated more interest in open source software. It has actually had some interesting side effects in the business world too. So the Raspberry Pi devices, the you know they were originally just single board computers with all the attachments, and you could plug them in and, and connect them to things. Well, a few years into having that, I think a couple of generations in, um, there was a display manufacturer 
uh, who just wanted things to work and be able to be testable and inspectable and have something that new hires and and kid and everyone like the generations coming in would know how to work with. This led to the creation of things like the Raspberry Pi compute module, which is inserted into all kinds of industrial equipment. But the benefit of that is that that compute module is can run exactly the same software that a full-blown Raspberry Pi SBC can, which means that you could take a compute module and use it for industry, and you can use the SBC for everything else, and the skills transfer, right? So this, this has meant that if you look at, for example, um, commercial uh, support for the Raspberry Pi, that's a market that exists. The whole reason the Raspberry Pi company now exists is because they want to be in on that to help support their work in the foundation. For a long time, they left it to everyone else. This is why, for example, SUSE is extremely notable for being the only enterprise Linux operating system that is fully supported on the Raspberry Pi. It is a thing that they list on their brochure on their re website for SUSE Linux Enterprise Server for ARM. They are the only enterprise Linux vendor that does this. There is also, from a professional or business Linux perspective, there's also Canonical with Ubuntu. They have made it a point to get Ubuntu fully supported on that platform. They take some interesting uh, routes to get there um, compared to what I would have done uh, or I think a lot of other people would have considered. But they actually do have it and they offer it. And it's a big part of their ARM support strategy. Um, this is a really important piece because the Raspberry Pi basically defines the ARM platform for the world now. With the notable exception of Apple Silicon Max, which is a brand new thing and a different topic altogether, the Raspberry Pi almost completely defines the ARM market. And so anything that doesn't support the Raspberry Pi officially, I mean, my opinion, again, just my opinion, is that they're a commercial failure. If they don't support the Raspberry Pi officially, they don't work on it, they don't interoperate with it, they are a commercial failure, full stop. That's the way I view it. And I think a lot of other people do now. And this is, again, why the Raspberry Pi company now exists. They can do things that a foundation is not allowed to do to further that goal, to then feed back into the charity's goal of supporting, educating people about computing. So you actually brought up a good point about a foundation, because in open source, we often hear about foundations supporting a project and whether that project is a distribution or an initiative or a piece of hardware or namely anything else. The foundation often serves as the financial backer for a particular project. And whether we like it or not, money does have a say in this. So sometimes when we talk about open source foundations, they mean different things to different people. And as far as the Raspberry Pi goes, we know it started off as a foundation. The company's a, a subsidiary of it. What do you guys kind of see as the symbiotic relationship between the two moving forward? So I think this is, well, I, I should also preface this with, this is not the first time this strategy has been employed. In fact, Mozilla in, basically created this strategy um, for the benefit of supporting Firefox and Thunderbird and all this stuff. The Mozilla Foundation created the Mozilla Corporation and MZLA Technologies. Mozilla Corporation handles Firefox, MZLA Technologies handles Thunderbird, and apparently other acquisitions and stuff like that. It's a whole other set of things. It does have some risks, as we've seen lately from Mozilla, where things get a little bit weird when it comes to how they pursue their strategy to support their foundation. But overall, it's a business that has allowed this concept of a foundation with a subsidiary for-profit corporation has allowed it to have a stronger staying power and have more revenue to support their mission than most of the other alternatives. Um, and if you take that subsidiary thing away, and I think the reason why the Raspberry Pi Foundation did this is going to come back to if they didn't have this, I don't think they will be they will have enough revenue to keep supporting their mission. So one of the reasons you would do something like this is that you know you're not getting enough money to compete to completely sustain yourself. 
So the reason Mozilla Corporation exists is because Mozilla needed something to handle the Google contract, the one that handles the the one that handles the default search revenue. That can't go directly to the foundation because then they would become for profit, and that's a whole big problem. But if there's a subsidiary ent- entity that's handling all that, then while it is legally complicated, it is a lot less uh, stressful from a tax perspective, which is important because if you turn a profit and you have enough times in enough years, your charity gets shut down because you're basically enriching yourself and not not the public. Um, for the Raspberry Pi Foundation and the Raspberry Pi Inc. or PLC, I actually don't remember which one they chose, but the Raspberry Pi company, they their goal here is to take over these fallow relationships with commercial entities and to and to invigorate them so that they can enrich the foundation. That means that they understand that they've left enough money on the table that it is dangerous for them. Yeah, in terms of the symbiotic relationship, I think anything that the company does, as long as it sticks to the to its values and continues to support the foundation, I, right away, I was just looking at the investor page uh, for the Raspberry Pi company. So, again, they're a publicly traded company now. $50 million has been distributed to the foundation. Uh, that's great. That's fantastic. A fairly decent revenue of $266 million and uh, gross profit was $66 million. I can't think of any other company that has gone public recently in the tech space that has been, granted this is gross profit, not net profit, that has been this profitable, even with gross profit. Yeah, that's not a thing that happens with IPOs. Uh, so, Usually they're close to broke. Yeah, and and that's why I, and and so as long as they continue to do this and continue on this trajectory of being very profitable and continuing to grow revenue and keep the foundation going to keep it going on its original mission of educating people in computers, basically giving them the same, not the same, but similar education that I had when I was a kid tinkering with a 386 and 486 computers. And that's, to me, that's a great, great thing to see uh, continue to occur. And I don't know how publicly traded companies work in Britain, uh, in the U.S. at least. They are, um, they need to adhere to uh, uh, sh- the shareholders. They're 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 for the sh- you know their own. It's owned by the shareholders, so they need to do what the shareholders ask and and demand. Uh, but if it's uh, the majority shareholders, so that yeah, that's fine. As long as it continues to stay that way, I I think we'll be fine. But I think it'll be fine. And and Neil, I do agree. Like a lot of what's happened with them in terms of like the open source is just the byproduct. It and I think that's absolutely. It, you can't have uh, a proprietary paid operating system on a device like this when your your target audience is uh education so i fully agree right and actually uh, to kind of jump off of this one of the reasons i suspect and again i don't know this for certain but i suspect one of the reasons why the raspberry pi company had to be created was because they were having trouble paying for supply like they were not building enough for the demand by a lot no, they couldn't. There was there was a couple of years where no one could buy a Raspberry Pi because there was simply no supply and no money to purchase more manufacturing. So this is a way for them to enrich their revenue stream streams because they're they're unblocked from the limitations of a charity. Yes. That that they that will allow them to be able to do better at that. Um my hope is that one of the other aspects of this is that now that the Raspberry Pi company exists, more direct relationships with ent- with enterprise open source companies can now be established. 
Historically, um, I can kind of speak sort of about this. Historically speaking, the Raspberry Pi Foundation didn't want to accept any kind of help directly from corporate developers or um, enterprises in general because they were afraid it would jeopardize their mission because that's how they perceived it, right? Like this is one of the reasons why um, the Raspberry Pi platform actually went through three Linux operating systems in its existence. The first one was Fedora-based, built out by the Seneca Institute, I think, in Canada. Um, the second one was Raspbian. Uh, and then the third one now is the Raspberry Pi OS, which is a descendant of the Raspbian, mind you, but it is different. And they did change enough of it that I consider it distinct. So it went through these three evolutions. And each of those times, it was either made by different teams or developed for different purposes or had, you know, these sorts of things. And it was always complicated for them, for the software side, because unfortunately today, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, um, open source software is mostly commercialized now. Um, and it is mostly people who work in enterprise and, the, and all this other stuff. And that makes things very difficult if you can't work with those people officially. And so um, one of the things I kind of hope coming out of this is that there's more room for commercial open source to partner with the Raspberry Pi and do more interesting things like I, uh, you know, one kind of call out here is like, I would love to see um, more cross promotion of the Raspberry Pi platform for commercial open source things. Like those are, those are opportunities that they can absolutely start doing that both furthers its success as a platform, but also furthers the foundation mission of broadening access and interest in tinkering with computers. We're seeing another another organization kind of emulate, they're not going public, but they're emulating this. Um, it, it's obviously for a different use case, and this is Home Assistant. You know, they've gone on, uh, the creators of it created a company, Nabucasa, and they've also created a foundation called the Open Home Foundation, and have started inviting standards bodies to participate and, and not just standard bodies, even uh, companies building home automation products appear to be starting to participate, which is fantastic. And I see the raspberry foundation is kind of one of those foundations. Yeah. It's a little, yeah, the, it's goals are definitely different. Uh, but uh, now you have uh, companies starting to build these foundations that act that are advancing uh, very specific goals of openness, or in the case of Raspberry Pi, at continuing to educate a new generation. I also want to point out one last thing because it just occurred to me. Um, I think we're almost what almost fifteen years since the one laptop per child project started um it it wasn't that i think it was it was more it was longer than 15 years ago oh that makes me feel really old dude <laughs> <laughs> the but like, pandemic remember- kind of altered our sense of time a little bit about how much time has really passed in the in the past five years i remember talking about this in high school and give it and talking about it in like civics class and stuff but anyway what i was going to point uh, out 20 years Oh my started gosh. In 2005. Oh my gosh. So it's basically 20 years at this point. Crap. Okay, I'm old. That's what this is what it's turned into. I'm old because I remember when it was notable and it was on the news all the time. But we now have a hundred dollar computer. The Raspberry Pi Foundation sells the Raspberry Pi 400. It is a complete kit. It is a fully assembled computer based on the Raspberry Pi 4 platform that you can just get started and use. The only things it lack are a display and a power source. But those things are now ridiculously cheap on their own. You can get battery kits that can power a Raspberry Pi for 
days at a time for, I don't know, like $30. Like, and, and those are reusable, rechargeable kits. And that's huge. And I think this is something that wasn't really noticed by people when it when it arrived. Uh, I remember when it, when it was originally announced, no one really made those comparisons. But I'm looking at it now as we're talking about this, and I realize they did it. Sort of. They did it. Sort of. The only way to actually accomplish the cohesiveness between the one laptop per child and the Raspberry Pi 4, the, the synergy there is you would have to put the device in a child's lap and then you get one laptop per child. Moving on. I'm sorry I had to add it. You knew that was coming. One Always. point for Bill with the, the dad joke of the episode. Always with the dad joke. Always. I have Always to. with the dad joke. Now, obviously, with a model like this, it's fairly new, although there is some precedent for it with, Neil, as you said, the Mozilla Foundation and, and ultimately the Mozilla company. What I'm curious about is, obviously, problems come up along the way when you create a company like this. What are some of the pitfalls that the Raspberry Pi company needs to be aware of along the way? How do they ensure they're successful moving forward? Business landscape changes over time. There are not a lot of prior models to go off of in terms of adaptability during different economic cycles. Brandon, you've been around the enterprise industry a long time and kind of understand the cyclical nature of it. Where do you think looking from the outside in that the Raspberry Pi Foundation should keep an eye on in terms of, of their potential pitfalls? I don't know, because this is, to me, this is new, right? The, this, is, this is too new. Yeah, the comparisons that, that Neil made with Mozilla, the comparison I made with Nubacasa, you know, valid. However, what they're doing is very different. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people expected was, was things like Raspberry Pi through the pandemic to collapse or even, or, or just stay as is. If any, it accelerated their growth, not slowed it down. Um, and, and for cheap devices like this and for open source in general, economic downturns, uh, typically enterprises are going to find alternative solutions to cut costs and the Raspberry Pi has a track record of, de I'm not going to say great reliability, but decent reliability, good enough. It's really uh, at that, probably at the stage of good enough reliability to handle these industrial use cases. And I, mean, I have a Raspberry Pi 3 uh, that I bought shortly after it was released and it still works great. Yeah. You know, uh, but I think that's uh, a testament to the simplicity of the device yeah. and uh, versus it's uh, versus general build quality. But uh, I, that's what a lot of companies are looking for. So I don't necessarily, unless uh, uh, there's like a major change in the silicon space and raspberry pi just happens to not pivot like you know if there was like a uh every you know everyone decided we're all going to risk five for low power systems not arm anymore for example or or even go back to x86 you know is x if x86 uh uh, uh becomes more power efficient et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah, you because know, anything could happen. I've seen lots of 
uh, lots of times everyone has said x86 is dead and then and then it then it keeps uh you know it keeps on trucking so i would say that probably the biggest risk to this to this model that they're that they have is that they get distracted um, that is the current problem that Mozilla has, is that they get very easily distracted. There's a lot going on, and there's a lot of pressure for them to respond to everything. I think one point in the Raspberry Pi's favor is that it is a concrete thing that they have to work towards. So for them, uh, there's a lot less that they can get distracted by. Um Obviously, there's a whole bunch of like expanding the product portfolio and doing other things and a lot of research and development and this and that. But fundamentally, because it's a hardware business, um, it is a lot harder for them to get distracted, pardon the pun, than it is with uh, a software business like Firefox with Mozilla, because you have to focus for a long time to produce something. Um, I, I will also note that the Raspberry Pi 5. The other thing that they're in danger of is satisfying the industry too much. The Raspberry Pi 5 is starting to come onto the edge where it's not useful for, for kids or hobbyists because it's getting out of range of disposable purchases, out of toy range. Like, it is incredibly important that they provide products that are complete and useful and practical that are within the range of a purchasing a toy. And that was extremely important in the beginning and is something that I've noticed has been disappearing from their from their the evolution of their of their products. Um, the Raspberry Pi I think now starts at $50. Um, actually if I go look right now, it start yeah, it starts at $60, right? The other aspect of it is like as they move forward into new generations of hardware, they're going to have new challenges on how to integrate it, right? Like these are all things, but because they have so much they have to work on, I have a feeling distraction isn't going to be a big problem for them. They have two major competing pulls on them though. And that's where I think the biggest risk is. The company will do a lot to satisfy its industrial and commercial partners but it's also got to do something to support the foundation's mission or otherwise the charity is going to get shut down by company's house. Like, and that's going to be a big problem too. So uh, that's uh, the, the biggest problem. The biggest thing they have to worry about is the tug of war between the foundation's needs and the company's needs um, and how that plays out. I don't know. We'll have to see in a few, uh, how it goes over the next few years. Um, I think we will have to wait, I want to say, two to four four years. It'll probably be about four years before we see anything actually come out of this of this new new venture. Because development roadmaps are somewhere between 18 to 20 months. And then productization and distribution uh, takes roughly a year after that. And then you're waiting a year to see the effects of that. So you're, we're probably four or five years out before we'll see whether this has a positive or negative impact on it. So obviously now we live in a world of AI. And while the Raspberry Pi isn't really designed for any AI intensive workload, given that- They're making an AI kit. They're making an AI kit for it. So that answers that. But I'm, I'm curious where, from a hardware standpoint, you see the Raspberry Pi going in that next five to 10 years from, from the raw- parts that go into it? Do we see a 10 gig capable Raspberry Pi? Do we see a Raspberry Pi that's got four NVMe slots for storage expansion? Do you, the answer I know we yes. have. Yeah, yeah, they actually, so one of the things that makes me worried about the Raspberry Pi is the fact that they're adding those features to the Pi. So the Raspberry Pi 5 has PCIe lanes and can drive a low end AMD GPU. Uh, that is, actually both good and bad. It's good in that it's become the hardware is more capable, but it's bad because it means that this hardware is getting more it's expensive. Gonna, yeah. What what one of the things I I would one of the things I'd like to see is for these component I I shouldn't yeah, I'm going to call them components to be modular. 
right? I know everyone is like, I know in the arm world, everything is on the SOC. But it doesn't have to be. It doesn't need to be for the, I'm going to say it, please, please. Let's just get everything. Can we please have socketed arm chips? I, I know I can get that in a server. I think I can get that in a Dampierre servers. You can also Double. get Ampere workstations for it. They're like five grand, but you can get them. Yeah, but but that's also but, five thousand dollars. Yeah, that's the price point of those workstations. So I just i i I know they're I know they're small single board computers, but we don't necessarily uh, find solder the chip onto the board. But uh, for AI chips, like let me. Uh, uh, attach it through some sort of bus through through through, uh, through some other through the PCI bus. That's Let's, that's currently what they're doing. So what yeah. they're doing is they're they're adding like yeah. no, they're adding me, daughter cards let, through the me, PCI uh, thing and connect yeah. them. Yeah, let me let me rephrase. Like let me continue to let it just be a PCI add-on for those who want it. Cuz not everyone is going to need a neural processing unit in their in a Raspberry Pi. And you other mean you don't words. AI on everything now? You don't AI on everything? I don't AI everything. Why? But the why other would thing you? too is there's there's other hardware now in this segment, and and Odroid or Duino that come to mind that are coming out with these modular expansion capabilities. Even internally at our company, we're looking at what kind of hardware could we provide a customer that wants to run home assistant on prem that has the ability to do nvme raid 1 mm-hmm. so a lot of those have their own challenges a lot of these single board computers and raspberry pi is no exception here is you is what's the os support like I mean, it's, and this is this is just a general problem with arm but yeah, you have Odroid, but what 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 CPU are they using uh, next year? We don't know. Like, I think uh, they've gone from MediaTek to um, to Rockchip to uh, to something else now. They used Exynos at one point, if I remember rightly. So there's a uh, whole they run the whole gamut, right? And the problem is that every one of these boards gets to be special. Every one of these boards has to be programmed into Linux in some meaningful way. Yeah, and that's. That's just uh, that's yeah. a limit. Uh, aside, aside that that beside the point, like right now, a lot of the, those boards are great. Not saying anything, not knocking them. I, mean, I have a a Turing RK one that I've been uh, beating my head against the wall on for about six months to get Fedora working on it. That's a different story <laughs> for another time. But what makes Raspberry Pi so successful is it's gotten the the mind share that the other uh, single board computer manufacturers have not gotten. Yes, these a lot of these single board computers are a thousand times more capable than a Raspberry Pi, but that's not what made the Raspberry Pi attractive in the first place. I have to ask this question. This will be the last question that I ask of you guys for this episode. But do you guys have any Raspberry Pi devices yourselves, either in your home lab or at your work? And how do you guys use them? I can tell you that for me personally, I've got four RPI units. Right now, I have each one sort of doing something different. The original intention when I first got them was to teach myself a bit of containerization and Kubernetes. And both of you know how I feel about containerization and how it feels about me. But long story short, I still have the units. They're still sort of running some containers at my house. And one of them is running uh, an instance of VPN that I use to connect here when, when required. So I'm just curious, do you both have any Raspberry Pi units yourselves? How do you guys use them? What do you like about it? And would you use it as a daily driver? I actually have three. Two of them are Raspberry Pi 3s, and one is a Raspberry Pi 4. 
Raspberry Pi 4 is running Home Assistant. The Raspberry Pi 3s are not currently in use at the moment. I have four Raspberry Pi 2s. I have three Raspberry Pi 3s. I have one Raspberry Pi 400. And I have a broken Raspberry Pi 4. Um, The Raspberry Pi 2s are not useful, so they don't do anything. Um, The Raspberry Pi 3s, I burned them out doing testing. Uh, And the Raspberry Pi 400 um, is what I have used in the past to do Fedora testing, desktop testing on ARM. Uh, And the Raspberry Pi 4 that I have, I don't do anything with it right now, I think, because... I misplaced it. I don't know where it is. Um, but uh, 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 only you would lose a computer. Only I you. also have Pinebook Pros and other kinds of random ARM hardware. I gave away my Pine sixty four devices because I was done with those. Um, I I have a lot of har- I also have. I have also an old first generation. Um, ARM server CPU motherboard from like eight years ago. And it was my one and only experience with an ARM computer that actually just worked without me having to do anything. Uh, uh, it, it is a rare experience. Uh, it is a wonderful experience that no one will ever experience. So basically, Neil has become the only human to go anywhere near the technology equivalent of the event horizon. I'll take it. (laughs) My foray with the pies has included trying to rack mount them, which that part was successful. What was not successful was powering them via PoE. It created so much noise that it was louder than an Production grade HP modular switch running at full crank. I thought I was sitting next to an aircraft hangar doing test runs on their engines. I don't recommend that at the moment if you need that within any sort of proximity of about 100 feet of yourself. (laughs) And for our viewers and listeners out there, unfortunately, no, we are not recording this episode from Raspberry Pi devices. I don't think that would be. I don't think that would not be wise. It would not be wise at the moment. Challenge accepted. No, no <laughs> challenge being done here. I like no. this. I like this. No. Oh no. <laughs> so it's gonna. We could do a live stream, and that way, we everyone can see how crappy the video production is from a Raspberry Pi device, and we don't risk a podcast episode. How about that? Well, I have an idea for you, Neil, uh, that I'd like to implement. And that is the next time you come up and visit the space that you affectionately know in my office here is your workstation won't have a laptop dock hooked up to it. It'll just be a Pi 3B. You realize that it can't even encode the video fast enough for us to do anything. I am sure that with the genius that exists inside your brain, you will find a way to make it work. I will rip that thing out and plug in my laptop. That's how it'll (laughs) make it work. Probably, if I had to venture a guess. But perhaps what we can do is find something useful for all of these pies to do in a future episode or in a lab or live stream or something else. I like the idea. We will entertain it. It's been great catching up with both of you. I'm glad to hear that summer has been going well for you guys. Uh, We have lots of wonderful things to talk about on future episodes, but for now we must depart. So as always, thank you for watching or listening to the Pseudo Show, a proud member of the Tux Digital Network, where business meets open source. Until next time.